perhaps the most iconic element of the comics form. The thing that sets it apart from every other medium, its most fundamental unit, is a box. Well, a frame. Technically, we call it a panel. And it's kind of a big deal. I'm Andrea Gilroy, and this is Comics Crash Course. So, I mentioned Scott McCloud quite a lot at this point, and, well, he'll keep coming up. Understanding comics is really is that foundational and useful a text for the burgeoning comics scholar. I'm bringing him up now because, well, in one way or another, panels are what make comics comics to Scott McCloud. His definition of the form, juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence, intended to convey information and or produce an aesthetic response in the viewer, is pretty much the single most famous definition out there. The two key words are juxtaposed and sequence, images put next to each other in deliberate order. And what separates those images from each other? Borders, panel borders. So besides starting with the point that panels are so important to comics that McLeod bakes them into the very definition of the form, for the rest of this episode, I'm actually gonna turn to what might rival understanding comics for the most top primer in comic studies. And that's Will Eisner's Comics and Sequential Art. So first written in 1985, the book is instructions for aspiring cartoonists, but it's written through the lens of Eisner's theory of comics form. And as such, it's really interesting and useful, even if you're not interested in creating comics yourself. And Eisner is also really jazzed about panels. The chapter dedicated to framing is probably the longest in the book. And so let me give you a few of his words on the subject. Quote, the fundamental function of comics art to communicate ideas and or stories by means of words and pictures involves the movement of certain images through space. To deal with the capture or encapsulation of these events in the flow of narrative, they must be broken up into sequenced segments. This, of course, means panels. Interestingly, one of the first things Eisner does is draw a distinction between film frames and comic panels. Why? Well, the comparison understandably gets made a lot, but Eisner says for comics, panels are part of the creative process rather than the result of technology. He goes on to explain that comic artists control the exact moment and the image of the panel, and readers control the amount of time they spend looking at each panel, which is completely different from film frames which move along at 24 frames a second, no matter what you do. So while you could look at each film frame individually, frame from film is the product of the technology of how film works, not necessarily the inherent function of the medium like the panel is in comics. So Eisner notes that panels aren't just about expressing images. It's also a mode of perception. As he says, as in the use of panels to express the passage of time, the framing of a series of images moving through space undertakes the containment of thoughts, ideas, actions in location or sight. The panel thereby attempts to deal with the broadest elements of dialogue, cognitive and perceptive, as well as visual literacy. The artist, to be successful on this nonverbal level, must take into consideration both the commonality of the human experience and the phenomenon of our perception of it which seems to consist of frames or episodes. Now, this is really fascinating. Eisner argues that we don't perceive our experiences as long, continuous takes, to use film terminology. Instead, we get flashes, episodes, frames, that we have to stitch together. This is perhaps most obvious in how we experience memory. And Eisner argues that comics as a form mirrors this mode of perception, and at the heart of this perception, as a series of stitched together fragments, the panel. And the panel is a tricky game of control between artist and reader. The process of breakdown means that an artist must choose one frozen moment out of a sequence to stand in for a whole series of actions, one that makes the most sense. The series of moments and the shape, the size, order, and composition of the panels is up to the artist. However, the reader takes over from there, how they fill in those missing moments, the rest of the scene, how much time they spend and importance they place on each panel, that's the reader. Heck, even what order they decide to read the panels in. Of course, artists can manipulate a reader's expectations and reactions, 
Cultural norms regarding reading order play a role, but so can things like panel shape, size, and even the type of panel border, the style of the line, and whether a border is literal or implied, the composition within the panel. This can all affect how the reader will react to and interact with the panels. And of course, the artist has some control over that. As Eisner reminds us, in addition to its primary function as a frame in which to place objects and actions, the panel border itself can be used as part of the nonverbal language of sequential art. He goes on further to say that panels can be narrative devices themselves. A frame's shape, or absence of one, gives it the ability to become more than just a proscenium through which a comic's action is seen. It can become part of the story itself. It can be used to convey something of the dimension of sound and emotional climate in which the action occurs as well as contributing to the atmosphere of the page as a whole. The intent of the frame here is not so much to provide a stage as to heighten the reader's involvement with the narrative, much like a play in which the actors interact with the audience rather than merely performing in front of it. So let's look at some examples, shall we? And let's start with the man himself. So what Eisner often did and was quite skilled at manipulating the traditional panel layout, often called a grid layout, rectangular panels and straight rows, what he's really known for is his more inventive use of panel structure. Take for example this page from The Dreamer. So while the page contains no traditional panel borders, sort of rectangles and squares, it's relatively easy to see where the images separate. Eisner uses structural details like doors and walls, and this is something he does a lot, as straight lines to imply panel borders without actually drawing them. Skylines and window panes work in similar ways here, too. Heck, he even uses the negative space of torrents of rain to act as separations in the middle row. Now, while this page from Life on Another Planet technically has a couple of rectangle frames in the more traditional sense, in other ways, the use of panels on this page is even more ambitious than the previous one. The way the sequence of images plays out in the second row is really fascinating in its overlapping use of space and time, as well as the way it combines the use of traditional panel borders, implied panel borders, and a structural panel border with the window. The layering and perspective of the bottom row, which contains two of the more traditionally shaped and bordered panels, is equally complex and fascinating. Now, this page from Craig Thompson's Blankets shares some similarities with the previous page of Eisner's that I just showed you, particularly in the way that the layout mixes overlapping images on the top and some square panels on the bottom. Now here, the overlapping borderless panels emphasize the main characters, Craig and Reyna, their intimacy and closeness, while the traditional borders on the bottom point toward a sort of separation, and that's literal. Reyna's parents are getting divorced and are refusing to see each other. Now this page, which just a few pages later, has a fascinating structural layout, and it's still playing with this idea of separation and intimacy. Reyna's parents are separate, and separated by panel borders, a very wide separation indeed. And Reina and Craig make their own panels on the top and bottom. And because of the lack of borders in their panels, something that emphasized intimacy on the earlier page, you would think that this is once again implying intimacy, but they're juxtaposed this time with the separated parents, and that implies separation. Because of the lack of panel border, it's harder to separate them from that separation. The central panel of the apple plays into the heavy biblical allusions of the text and implies a temptation of Craig and Reyna to cross yet another border, this time a physical one. So here, Thompson uses panels not just to imply and create a kind of emotional language about the characters, but then uses that language to imply subtle shifts in their relationships across just a few pages. It's pretty cool. So two different artists enhance the emotional, narrative, and visual strengths of their pages by manipulating the basic unit of comics, the panel. Now, there's a whole lot more to panels, but we've done a lot for today. So we'll call it here for now. More next time. See you then.